Um, I'm happy to, my name's Mike Ostermeller. I'm gonna be facilitating this conversation for the next hour. Um, and I'm happy to introduce our esteemed and uber qualified panel, Representative Steve Waldrop, who is doing his best to fake an injury in case he gets bored or in case he's talking even more incoherently than normal. He has a built-in excuse for that. He says he had surgery yesterday and has some kind of nerve blocking agent still floating around in there. So who knows what might come from Steve. And if we're not sure what's gonna come from Steve, we're never sure what's gonna come from Christina Oliver. Uh, if you get her ginned up just a little bit, just get her riled, get her worked up a little, there is an unlimited amount of entertainment that can come in addition to really good substantive information. But uh, I should have said Steve's with the, Steve is a Utah uh, legislator, uh, an outgoing legislator because he's seen the light and decided he wants some quality of life back. So he's leaving the legislature at the end of this year after uh, uh, an incredible legislative career uh, and Steve was heavily involved in all, in all sorts of housing issues during his time uh, at the legislature. Uh, Christine Oliver is the executive director for the Utah State Department of Housing and Community Outreach or something like that. Is that, did I get that right? Okay. <laughs> and then uh, Mayor Jeff Silverstrini from Mill Creek City. So um, in just a second, we'll have uh, Christina start. And we're gonna kind of give, she's gonna give a quick overview of what is happening in the state of Utah in terms of uh, what the state is doing in actual programs to help with housing affordability uh, uh, at all levels. And then talk a little bit maybe about where the state might go in the future in terms of doing something to help uh, address or mitigate, if not alleviate the, the problem. And then we'll have uh, Mayor Silverstrini go next. He's going to, uh, uh, Jeff's going to give kind of uh, a local government's perspective in terms of what Mill Creek has done a little bit. They've been one of the more progressive cities in this space and also what's happening around the state um, with other municipalities and kind of what they're doing to, to help with the problem. And then we'll have Representative Waldrop um, back clean up after that. And Steve's, Steve's going to talk about uh, he'll get a chance to defend himself in terms of some in, so, in terms of legislation that's been talked about already at this conference and that will undoubtedly come up again uh, during during this panel uh, and then also I've asked Steve he's involved in a really creative out of the box kind of private innovative solution uh, a partial solution to housing affordability and so I've asked him to take a few minutes and kind of describe that just so you can get to know what he's doing and also see it as an example of where there are out of the box, really creative, uh, uh, as Nicole said this morning, enterprising ideas that can be had, especially as private and public partnerships. Just by way of introduction, uh, I, I, I grabbed the president of our multiple listing service and I, uh, and I said, hey, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm doing this panel on affordable housing. Can we pull some data really quick so that I can give them a couple of statistics? And he said, sure. And I said, well, I would like to show them how much of a lack of starter home inventory we have in the state of Utah. It's the biggest part of this crisis. And, and, and I think the reason is, is that most people who have been in the housing market for a while, especially over the last five or 10 years, we've done pretty well. Right? We've all seen values of our property go up, even though interest rates have now gone up and housing prices are at an all time high and we now have high interest rates without having the market having had an opportunity to self correct yet. Um, people that have been in the market still do okay. Who is really suffering out there are first time home buyers. And one of the reasons they're suffering courses, interest rates. Another reason is just a lack of what we traditionally call starter homes or uh, first time homes in the market. So let me just gonna give you a couple of numbers that will blow your mind here. We just, we just pulled these yesterday. So these are very current. So the first question is what's a, what's a starter home, right? Like what counts as a starter home? And so we looked at um, the average uh, annual income in Utah was, up until it was recently updated, it was household income was about $65,000 per year, okay? So if you run the numbers and you take like a 6% interest rate and you take the average median income and let's say they have $10,000 or let's say they have 10%, okay, which is about $19,000 for a down payment, that would be about a two hundred dollars to $225,000 starter home. 
is what that family would be able to afford. So I said, how many of those are on the MLS right now? By the way, there's about 10,600 listings on the multiple listing service on utahrealestate.com. The answer is zero. I said, all right, we're being too restrictive in our definition of, of uh, starter home. Let's bump it up. Let's bump it up to, to 250,000. Guess how many? Zero. I said, okay, let's go to $300,000. So just to put this in perspective, if an average household income today is $75,000 family average income, if they have a 10% down payment saved, which is $22,500, and let's say the mortgage rate's about 6%, they could afford about a $250,000 home. So they would still likely be priced out of the $300,000 uh, starter home that we looked at, we found single digits. There are fewer than 10 that are $300,000 or less. I said, well, okay, we're being way too restrictive. So let's go to $350,000, okay? To afford a $350,000 home, and Chris Sloan, you tell me if I'm wrong on my numbers here, but we based this um, we, we took a look and said, okay, let's assume somebody has a, a good down payment of about $30,000. Let's assume about a 6% interest rate. Um, somebody is going to need to have a family combined income of about $125,000, and they're going to have to have about 15%, 15 to 20% of the down payment saved up as cash in order to get into their first home at today's interest rates. That still, still doesn't allow that family making $125,000 and has good credit to afford a $350,000 home. Okay, but of all of the $350,000 homes uh, on the market right now, we found out of the 10,500 listings, there are about 400 and about 470 listings on the entire MLS for single family homes. If you combine condos, twin, twin homes, duplexes, town homes, and single family homes, we combine everything at that $350,000 uh, amount, there's about 900 listings, okay? So that's about 9% of the total inventory and that's at $350,000. So it is a massive problem. It's, it's a significant problem and there's obviously solutions are going to need to be multiply faceted, we're gonna to have to look at lots of diverse solutions and there is not one entity, organization, group or, or individual that can solve the problem. But just with that as sort of a backdrop and my opportunity to kind of remind everybody that's where our starter homes, first time homes, that's what we need more than anything else. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our panel and we'll let them get started. And by the way, uh, feel free to ask questions to any of our presenters as they're speaking, they're all, comfortable with that, and then at the end, hopefully we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. But if you have questions as they're going, don't wait, fire them at, fire it, fire it, they're, they're ready to take them, right? They can fire away. All right, do you wanna come up here or are you gonna stay there? Either way, yeah. How is everyone? I want to take a poll. I don't know the audience here. So who is from local government? What other interests do we have? Private development? Legal, am I missing anybody? Wow, so a pretty diverse crowd. I want to uh, add on to some of those statistics. I think this is a really stark um, statistic that just came out. As of the end of Q2 2022, 76% of our renter households cannot afford the median priced income in the state of Utah. That is extremely scary. In 2019, it was 49% of our renter households. So the numbers that you were hearing about the MLS, um, uh, the, the homes on, on market, I can't talk today, I apologize, it's gonna be one of those days. What I like to do, I drive around the state of Utah quite a bit and work with rural communities. I go through, I get on Utah MLS, I pull up their houses for sale and then I pull our wage data and I compare them and it's, it's extremely scary. Wages have not caught up to the price of homes. I'm just gonna do a quick overview of a variety of the things that our office does and then 
we can get to the really exciting stuff. So some of the things that we work on in housing and community development is infrastructure. We run the Community Impact Fund, which is basically mineral lease fund from the federal government. If you're new to Utah, most of our state is federal land. Uh, we have a Uinta Basin Navajo Revitalization Fund. We do the Community Development Block Grants and Community Services Block Grants. Does anybody know what these things are? Like one or two people are saying yes. So the federal government provides quite a bit of money to the state of Utah to build roads, to upsize water pipes, to build uh, fire stations, purchase pump trucks for fire stations. The state of Utah disperses that throughout the rural areas in the community. I might not. Nobody wants you. So they can hear you. <laughs> okay. Also, we run the statewide planning. So earlier today, you heard from Laura Hansen, uh, the Governor's Office of Planning and Budget Planning Coordinator. She and I work very closely. We both fund planners throughout the state of Utah to work with towns and, and smaller municipalities who may not have the staffing to update ordinances, to do proactive planning as well as reactive planning in some s situations. Other programs that we have, of course, are the Olean Walker Ho Housing Loan Fund. Who's heard of that? So like very few still, that's fine. We run uh, gap financing is the best way to put it. So if you think of a layered cake, this is how I like to explain your affordable housing development. There are major components that go into it. The first is what is called private activity bonding. Private activity bond is not real cash. Uh, we run the board, we allocate a certain amount of bonds. When you're developing um, an affordable housing project, at least 50% of your project has to be financed through private activity bonds. That is extremely, uh, it, it is a little sad because in the state of Utah, that allocation, it equates to about $200 million a year. And with the price of construction, you can imagine the, the, uh, the number of units that could be built, but for having more private activity bond. The second layer of the cake is called low income housing tax credits. Anybody hear of those? For the lucrative uh, low-income housing tax credits, which is an equity source, you have to have that 50% private activity bond in order to get what's called the 4% low-income housing tax credit. There's also what is called the 9% low-income housing tax credit in the state. You don't have to have private activity bonds for that, but we're also limited. Our population is pretty low in the state, so all of the programs I'm talking about are limited by our population. So the 9% tax credits are limited. They're just under 10 million this last year. But that's another equity source. But I hope what I'm illustrating to you is that there isn't a ton of cash out there for these affordable housing developments. You, you think in the magnitude of a couple hundred million dollars, the units that we're seeing being built, and with developers in the room, you can correct me, we're getting up to $370,000 for a two bedroom unit in some of our affordable housing complexes. They're standard apartment buildings. You wouldn't recognize that they're affordable housing units, but for, perhaps the marketing that they've done. Um, also run the Section 8 incentive for landlords. What this does, anybody heard of housing vouchers? Um, they're not called housing vouchers anymore, but that's a name that's most recognizable. Landlords don't necessarily like to house folks on the housing vouchers, and there, there is unfortunately some damage that comes with certain tenants on vouchers, and that's been a historical trend. So what the state of Utah has is up to $5,000 to reimburse landlords should they take a, it's incentivizing them to take a Section 8 housing family, and if there's any damage that's above normal wear and tear, then we reimburse the landlord to make them whole. Uh, we also run the weatherization program. We get a 20 plus million dollars a year. Again, this is more in rural Utah and it's income um, uh, based, but we go out and we do things like fix windows and drafty doors and we get new water heaters and all sorts of things. It's, it's a really great program. The other two, these are pandemic, pandemic funded programs. Has anyone heard of the emergency rental assistance program? The program that arbitrarily bumps up rents, no? Okay, well that's my program. Um, <laughs> It's real. I'm trying to be, I'll be professional. So this, what this was, was I like to call it the program that Treasury would like me to stand on a corner with a leaf blower and dollar bills and give everybody all the money that they want. We have some parameters. Uh, so we pay up to 18 months of rent for folks who have been impacted by COVID and this program is dwindling down. So we're excited about that because there has been a lot of, uh, in, 
some inflation in rents based upon this program. So we're hoping that'll stabilize it a little bit. The Homeowners Assistance Fund we just launched two weeks ago. This is for income-restricted families as well. We are providing up to $35,000 grant if you have delinquencies, and those delinquencies are associated with COVID. We only have about $60 million for this program. I say only $60 million, but in the grand scheme of what we've been dealing with the past three years, that's like a, it's a rounding error. And is that all federal money? All, all federal money, yes, absolutely. <clears throat> any questions? Anybody can shoot up at any time. Or is, this is so riveting, I know. Uh, so I'm going to go over a little bit of the recap of 2022, HB 462. I'm not going to get too much into the details because the representative and the mayor are going to go into it um, in more specificity. But the highlights are we have a new moderate income housing plan requirement, a station area plan. Everybody know what a station area plan is? Please say yes. If not, coming to a town near you. So the station area plan is really going to be uh, focusing on within a half mile radius of our transit stations, not only front runner and tracks, but also BRT. And it's going to be planning for density along those stations. Point of the mountain housing. So there's an effort, of course, if you haven't heard, the prison has moved. And that redevelopment of the site will have a component of affordable housing. Who here knows that if you are a municipality or a special service district or your CITLA that you can provide land not at fair market value for affordable housing? One person. So this is like the least utilized program or allotment in state code thus far. And we're really trying to promote it. So affordable housing is expensive. You're, in the, in the capital stack, you have certain financing, right? So if you're making $100 a day and only 30% of your income can be spent on your housing, you've got $30. If you have an entire building of people in that particular demographic, you are limited on what your rent, on what your cash flow is gonna be. So any uh, financial tool that we have to move the needle so that that debt service is reduced, we wanna try and get people to utilize. So this is an exciting expansion. Um, we are also doing more local land use training, uh, land use ordinance reviews, which I'm sure a lot of people have interest in. New down payment assistance we're working on for uh, corrections officers and officers throughout the state. Municipal workers are difficult to not only hire but maintain their employment. And so we're looking at a variety of different programs to assist in, in allowing for home ownership, which we believe will keep people employed in those particular arenas. Um, housing Preservation Fund, this is one of my, my close and personal favorite. This is a fund that the legislature has provided over $40 million to. It's paired over three to one with philanthropic dollars. What they do is they go in, we have thousands of units coming off the books. I have an entire report where deed restrictions are starting to expire. In today's market, those units are being flipped for market rate. One of the core principles of affordable housing is you don't want to build the projects, right? You don't want to put everybody in one area. You want to disperse them throughout the community because when we talk about affordable housing, who knows what the, the four-person median income is in Salt Lake County right now? $102,000. So if you're two young kids out of college and you have two kids and you don't make $102,000, you're not even in the median income bracket for the state. So we're not talking about... $15,000 a year households. We're talking about $60,000, $70,000 a year households. So it's very important that a lot of our units that are already on the ground are purchased, refurbished, re rehabbed, if you will, and kept deed restricted for our, our uh, affordable housing community. And then we also have some Section 8 funding. I am going to just jump because I do want to turn over the time a little bit to talk about the moderate income housing database to both the representative and the mayor. So maybe I can sit down and yep. I'll just click from over there. So my name is Jeff Silvestrini. If you don't know me, uh, I'm the mayor of Mill Creek, which is a, an inner rank suburb of 62,000 people immediately south of Salt Lake City. Uh, and. Uh, and we have a, we go from the mountains all the way over to the Jordan River, so we big, broad, uh, diverse community, socioeconomically, uh, pretty affluent east side and, and less so west side. Um, I'm also, I've had the privilege of, as I mentioned in my question earlier, to serve as the chair of the Wasatch Front Regional Council. I get to do that until January, I think, and, uh, and then I'm 
surrender that and I'd be the president of the Utah League of Cities and Towns this coming year. And the reason that I do this, I, I like hats, okay? I have to have a lot of different hats that I wear so I don't get skin cancer. So um, the point of this is uh, Mill Creek is a new community. We wanted a seat at the table, I guess. I guess we have it now. Um, one of the, the things that that's opened up to me, I guess, is to work with, with great people like Representative Waldrop on legislation in the, in the uh, last several sessions. And I want to talk about House Bill 462 because um, I think that um, that's a bill that, um, that uh, Representative Waldrop sponsored and, um, and had a great deal of input from the league. We set many hours uh, discussing this in various locations to try to come up with some answers that would hopefully move the needle with respect to moderate income housing in our state. And uh, you know, I sat through this morning, super interested in hearing uh, uh, about the challenges we have. Um, I, yeah, from my perspective, in my city, I think we're making progress with respect to, to uh, building more housing. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but then you just bummed me out with your numbers about uh, about um, affordability for young families and first-time home, home buyers. Um, that is super important because um, our our the American way of life, the American dream, on our society is built upon people of being able to build wealth through home ownership. And if we turn off that faucet and don't keep that happening. Um, it's going to be a, a problem that's going to haunt us for, for several generations, if not, if not forever. We cannot, we have to solve this problem. And, and the way we solve this problem is the, is the Utah way of collaborating with local government, working with the, the private development community and state government and federal government, because I have some things on, on the list for them as well. Um, but we all have to work on this because we've got to solve this problem. And um, I, think, I think we can do it. So House Bill 462, um, I, I think actually offers us the promise for the first time of being able to legislate housing policy in our state using data rather than anecdotes. Um, we, we, we have had legislation by anecdotes for ever and ever, but, but um, I don't know how many of you in the room, a lot of local government folks here, how many of you are involved with filing your moder moderate income housing plans with Department of Workforce, Ser Workforce Services this fall, October 1st? So, uh, uh, huh? Well, how what? Uh, yeah, I, I'll ask you how it was. I, I know how it was because I was involved in that, at least in our cities. And um, you know, it's extra work for us, um, but I think it's important because it's the it's the thing that's going to, I hope, let us know what's moving the needle, what's actually working, and what's not working with respect to various strategies toward uh, toward uh, you know getting more moderate income housing. So every city that had uh, certain areas had transit stations, either BRT or, or tracks or front runner. Um, um, in certain areas, over 5,000 population had to file one of these reports. And I think, um, I don't have the exact numbers, but I think there were some 80 some cities that had to do that. And we, we accomplished the goal of doing that mostly. I think there may be about six cities that haven't done it. Some of them have some excuses. Some of them we have to have a conversation with. Um, that, that every one of these cities is motivated to, to file these plans because um, House Bill 462 ties um, basically the most substantial part of road funding that, that municipalities get through the Transportation in, um, Improvement Fund, the TIF, or the Transit Transportation Improvement Fund, the TTIF, which are uh, administered by our metropolitan planning or organizations uh, uh, in form of grants to improve roads, right? So in Mill Creek and Holiday, we were able to reduce 39 South from 23 East up to the 215 freeway with about eight and a half million dollars that was mostly TTIP, mostly TIP. And, and so that funding source, Chris, is very important to cities uh, and, and we're motivated to comply with this, not only because it's the right thing to do, but also because um, th that, that funding is now tied to um, reporting our moderate income housing plans. And, and then there is also a, a, a mechanism for priority funding under 462 uh, for those communities that choose more than the base number of options. Uh, and uh, the statute sets forth about 24 different options that municipalities can adopt toward implementing moderate income housing. 
and, uh, and requires them to select them, uh, at least three if you don't have a transit station or, or, or a BRT station, and five if you do. And then uh, more than that if you can, and uh, I'm hoping that a lot of communities like Mill Creek, we pick nine, okay? Um, we wanted to make sure that we were in the priority line and, uh, and it's important, at least in our community, to, to address this growth. And um, ties me into one of the things we talked about this morning. How do you deal with, uh, with those members of our community that are re resistant to change, or you know, particularly in built out communities like Mill Creek is, um, how do you convince people that, um, that principally occupy single family residential neighborhoods that we need multifamily housing? Okay, how do you how do you deal with that? And you know, as local officials, as elected officials, you know that's our that's our ballot, right? Is uh, is is uh, dealing with our constituents um, and addressing their concerns and listening to them. And while I know there are those in the in, that have the viewpoint that local government needs to be insulated from that type of of input, um, I I suggest that uh, the, a lot of us that that chose this field um, and and hold these offices. Um, um, don't mind talking to our constituents. It's a, it's a truly important part of our functioning democracy for people to feel like they're invested in their community and they're heard, okay? And, and, um, and so when we have these conversations with them, and thank goodness for Laura Hansen and that state appropriation to help us have a statewide conversation on growth because we all need to, to educate ourselves better about this. But what I, what I like to do is talk to my constituents about this and, and, and educate them basically. And what I found is that you can make difficult decisions as an elected official. Um, it's a lot easier to do that if you explain the reasons why you're making those decisions and, and people can understand that. So you have to kind of bring them along through the course of a public meeting and explain these things to them. And some of us may be better th at that than others, but, um, but I think it's a necessary part of the grassroots closest to the uh, government, closest to the people role that we play. Um, most of you who uh, have sat through a public meeting in Utah, um, and maybe this is true in other parts of the country, I just don't know because I don't have that experience, but you know, you'll get, uh, you'll get a public comment either on just open public comment or when you're dealing with a, with a rezone or a subdivision or whatever kind of land use application, you'll get Jeff Silvestrini coming up to the podium and he will say, um, thank you for having me. Um, my name is Jeff Silvestrini. I've lived in Mill Creek for 37 years. I have, I'm proud of my five children that I raised and my 32 grandchildren, but I am sick and tired of all this growth. <laughs> okay, so, so the, 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 I tell that story, but the reason that that story is, is relevant and can be used by all of us that are interfacing with the public on this growth issue is, and, and, and then we have a question here about where the growth comes from, but, but, but most of the growth especially over time. It may have changed in the last couple of years where we're seeing more in-migration from other states. But most of the growth over time has been our own kids and grandkids. And once I think you can help people appreciate that and that their kids and grandkids want to live by them. They want to live in the town that they grew up, you know? And that's, that's a great thing that we have going for us in Utah. It's part of the, the, our quality of life and, uh, and our value on families and appealing to people's values is exactly the way to touch them, um, giving them statistics and, and uh, telling them that the legislature says we have to do this. That is not gonna satisfy them. They're gonna go away super unhappy. So, so appealing to their values, helping to understand why we have to plan for growth, um, I think is the way to uh, accomplish this. And frankly, I've seen it work, okay? In, in Mill Creek, in my town, we've been able to, you know, we saw, we saw a, train, a freight train coming at us with uh, redevelopment in a certain part of our city by the Brickyard. If you're familiar with Mill Creek and Southern Salt Lake City, you know where the Brickyard is on 33rd South, uh, 13th East and Highland Drive in that area. We're building a town center in that area where we're gonna have a, a, a lot more density than our community has ever been used to. Um, this ties into what was said before about uh, North Salt Lake, about wanting to have a town center. We heard that too, um, and, and we, approach this with the idea of, of um, involving our community in a discussion about making a trade off about density versus public amenities. We, 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 we 
at meeting after meeting where we explained that we had applications for multifamily development in this area and it was coming, really, it was, the area was already zoned commercial. It was gonna come whether people liked it or not. The question is gonna be, are we gonna have ordinary, unremarkable three-story walk-up apartment buildings or are we gonna allow some more density, some more height, some more density and, and do some trade-offs with the development community to get some more amenities for our community? And as a result of those conversations, you will see that in this area of Mill Creek, we have two more stories of height than what the original zone allowed for. We implemented a city center zone that, that allowed people to go up to 75 feet. Um, we did a strategy where we have something called a step back, which is the building can go up four stories and then it has to step back a distance and then you can go up farther. So that makes it not appear as tall from the street. We took people to, to examples of that in Sugar House and in Holiday and other places and showed them what it could look like in public engagement. And at the end of the day, we have um, a development that's coming in here that, that I think our residents mostly love. It, we also did something because we had an area that was uh, covered by an earthquake fault where we issued a, a, a bond, the city issued a $20 million bond and with some help from the state with the, some outdoor recreation grant money, we built a, an ice skating and roller skating loop and a splash pad and, and we'll have a public market on this plaza um, and then ultimately this will be about a six acre uh, park with some green space, we're gonna do phase two. But telling you all that just to, to let you know that um, if, if public engagement done right, I think you can, you can, talk, you can talk to our our neighbors about the fact that we need to have this development so that their kids can have housing. So back to 462, um, I think that, that, that this, let me, let me interrupt you okay. and ask you one more question. I think this is important for this group. When you guys did the development agreements on these apartment buildings, you did something I think that's really unique in requiring conversion to ownership. So talk about that for a second, because I think that's a critical piece. Yeah, so one, one of the huge challenges that we have um, in, is in terms of the actual affordable housing and home ownership is making some of this multifamily housing available for private ownership. And I think it was mentioned earlier, and I think this is, I'll, I'll say this is true also, if you can offer a community that people are going to own condos or own their own houses in apartment buildings or multifamily things, they're, they're much more palatable to the community than if they're gonna be renters, just because everybody knows that that ownership piece is an investment in the community. So what we've done is to talk to the development community that's putting these uh, uh, units in and convince them to basically make commitments to us that they will, they will commit to convey a certain percentage of those units into private ownership over time. It, we're dealing with uh, projects that are being built in a federal opportunity zone, and so in, in, there's some financing constraints and things like that about condominiumizing things immediately, but we have been able to get commitments in exchange for additional density to, uh, to convert at least a percentage of those units to ownership when they can do that, when their financing permits them to do that. One of the things we need to work on in future legislation with both our state government and our federal government is to unlock the, the, uh, the, the financing barriers to owner-occupied multifamily housing, okay? And we've heard some creative things. Clark Ivory mentioned, you know, longer-term mortgages. That's a great way to make stuff more affordable. But there are also a lot of uh, reasons why the development community is not interested in condominiums anymore. And, and we need to kind of unlock that. I don't know if a condominium is the only vehicle, but we need to, we need to, get rid of those barriers to that or, or because that's what we need to, to is to solve the both the affordability and the and the home ownership problem just because it's gonna be more affordable if it's in a multifamily building than if it's single family because of the land costs, right? Um, so so anyway I'm talking maybe longer than I should. But uh, yeah. I just want to make a comment about that really quick. And the mayor is exactly right and we need all kinds of housing. We're short all of it. But I would put in a plea, especially to my city, my municipal friends who are in the room, what we don't have and, and, and what has to be a big part of the solution is small lot, single family detached owner occupied housing. I promise you, Chris Gambrulis can build it and sell it as fast as you will permit it. Chris Sloan, how many of your clients, either as first time home buyers or retirees who are looking to downsize or whatever, they're dying for this type of housing and it, and it doesn't exist. And there are some really cool designs out there that 
you know, I'll say my 24 year old son, his whole thing looking for his house was to try to find the smallest yard possible. Because I traumatized him. I made him take care of a big yard growing up. He doesn't want that. Most millennials don't. So I would just put that plea in to all of you to reconsider your position on that and to take a look at some creative designs around small lot. I'm talking six, seven, eight, nine, twelve units to an acre, single family detached or occupied housing. Thanks, Mike. You want to time to talk? Because I want to talk, I also want to talk about what might be coming up in the legislature this session, okay? All right. All right. So, so I, I can tell you that, that the, I think the, the league is, we're going to, you know, first of all, I, I super appreciate the fact that, that the current leadership of our legislature has been willing to have collaborative discussions with local government and, and uh, property rights coalition and uh, basically all the stakeholders in this space. Um, because I think we'll get better policy if we can all work together and, and warn each other about unintended consequences about what, what might happen if, if, if you use Jeff's idea versus, versus Chris's idea, okay? Um, but th there's, there are a couple initiatives that I think that the League is going to offer that, that may help um, address some of the concerns that have been in, in this housing space. So, so the public clamor part, um, you know, I, I, as I mentioned, um, I'm, not a, I'm not afraid of talking to the residents in my community, right? And sometimes we have difficult conversations, but, but, um, but I, I truly do believe that there is an appropriate time for public input on, on a lot of these development applications. And I, and I know that, that our planning commission as well as the development community have learned things through that public comment um, that are valuable. For example, local use of a, a traffic pattern where a, a, you know, a, a, a entrance or egress to a development would be problematic if it's here, but not if it's over there. You move it and it's fixed, right? Everybody's, everybody's happier. Um, but I, but, the, but we, what we've heard is that, is that too much of that public input and repeated public input um, can slow projects down and can, be, can, can uh, may, maybe give elected officials a pause about something that they may have approved on a preliminary basis but then, but then go back on what they did and create a bunch of expense for a developer and a waste of time. So the league is going to propose that, with, at least with respect to subdivision applications, that we take a look at our state code and um, a make it uniform. There are a lot of questions in that right now about about when whether there's a public hearing, when the public hearing occurs, is there a public hearing at at, at concept approval, at preliminary approval, and at final approval. Uh, those three steps are probably a good idea because you 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 get um, an idea at concept approval about whether something will work in terms of a general layout and and all that and and you and you you, you get an approval on that so that the, so that the developer doesn't have to spend a bunch of engineering money you know finalizing or getting plans refined um, and then you have you know fire review and things like that that need to happen. So the point that, that we would propose, that the league is gonna propose is, is um, let's have public com comment early in the process and then, and, and once, okay? And then let's make the, the uh, approvals beyond a concept approval um, in, to the, in the preliminary and the final, let's make those administrative. Let's, let's let those, those municipalities that have staff to deal with that, let's let the staff deal with that because that, we're gonna take that away from the public clamor. We've already gotten the public input that we need to, have, to make sure that we have a good plan, uh, but we don't slow it down and cost more money that way. So that's one initiative that we wanna explore um, in, the, in this space. Um, the other thing that we would like to do is, um, is look at, particularly in projects that, that, that contain a moderate income housing component, um, you know, can we can we uh, essentially change the referendum requirements to, to say that if a project is approved by a two thirds vote or whatever, it's not re not referable, or or make it so that the referendum process isn't something that's um, a terror in the room for everybody. Um, I mean, we all respect. I hope the the fact that there is a place for a referenda, right? Um, it is it is a constitutional right, but um, but there are ways to to um, effectively regulated so it doesn't get in the way of every project. And then uh, the other idea that we have is some kind of a state infrastructure bank, okay? There are a number of projects that would be aided um, if, the, 
infrastructure for the project could have a boost so that the project can be built. A lot of times municipalities are, are facing um, the idea of how are, we gonna, how are we gonna sewer this project? How are we gonna pro provide water to it? How, how do we do the, the, uh, you know, the corridor preservation to widen the street when it needs it someday? The state infrastructure bank might provide loans for that. But the other thing that I want to say, okay, to the development community is a mayor and a city that has a, a, a zone in, in our the west side of Mill Creek by the track line, okay, where we want to see that development. We have uh, we have a zone that has unlimited density in that in that zone, okay, and we're not seeing anything other than podium construction projects, you know, and there's no reason you couldn't go to ten stories there along a tracks line. The, the, the barrier is having to go from, from wood to steel, okay? I get that the cost of that, it has to pencil. So the state infrastructure might, bank might be a, provide a loan to a developer to bear that additional cost or spread it out um, over time so that we can actually maximize our transit assets in a real way. And where, and where we've opened up unlimited density, let's take advantage of unlimited density, you know? Let's not, let's not make everything a six-story building. Um, the other thing that we'll be uh, proposing is that um, the uh, the legislature opened up the prospect of a fifth quarter of a it's actually a quarter of a percent of the sales tax um, that is, has to be enacted by counties, but um, up to this point it's it's solely for transit and it hasn't been well used, right? And so th th we may want to have a discussion about that about how we could potentially. Uh, change the rules on that, allow that enactment of that other quarter percent, and then maybe split it, half of it for transit, uh, which was the original intent. Um, but give, tie, it, uh, tie it to the same types of restrictions in House Bill 462, so that if cities are not compliant with, uh, with moderate income housing plans, then they don't get it. But if they did get it, that's the other thing that could be used for infrastructure and, uh, and to basically enable some of, the, some of this Development. I mean, fundamentally, I think um, our our housing problem is uh, the, and, the, and the escalation of values that we've seen that are keeping people from buying houses. There's a supply and demand element to this. We all took Econ 101, right? And we know that. Um, so these are kinds of these are kind of solutions I think that will help us uh, continue to move the needle on that. And I'm super hopeful that uh, we're going to solve this problem in Utah, Representative. Problem solved. Um, let me let me just go over real quickly here some of the other changes on 262, uh, 462. Sorry, that uh, yeah, just uh, and and a couple things we haven't touched a lot on. This this database that you guys are all participating in, we're in municipal government. Thank you. Um, it's my fault, sort of, um, that you're doing that. And you had to do that extra work this year, but um, we funded uh, the state. Uh, Department of Workforce Services to create a statewide database so we can aggregate data on what we have, where we have it, and and uh, how much it costs, and all of those things that we currently don't know. Most of this information is available, but it's very regionalized. And in, in order to create good policy around affordable housing, we need to know what we have. We need to know where our density is, and, and it's to this point, it's been driving up and down I-15 and looking over to the left and looking over to the right. Oh yeah, these guys are doing great. Oh, these guys aren't doing so great. We don't have good data. And so this, I think, will be one of the, the critical drivers for future legislative decisions is what do we have and where do we have it? And Christina is working diligently on that. And uh, the mayor, as he already mentioned, is already uh, you know putting together reports on that. We're gonna be um, comp compiling that data so that everybody has access to it. It's a searchable state database that um, can then be cross-referenced with things like income and you know other things that will help us make informed decisions because to this point, we've been largely flying blind. Um, so I think that's a critical piece of 462 that will, you know, it's, it's kind of under the radar, but, it, but I think it will inform our future decisions uh, to a tremendous degree. Uh, what else am I missing, Christina? Nothing, okay, I'm missing nothing. Um, you know, and, and let me just say, it's been an absolute pleasure to work with Marcella Strini, with the League, with the development community. Um, we have amazing League leadership right now um, in the state. They are forward thinking, they are open minded, and they're working to create solutions. Um, and, and I think we've been able to foster that 
relationship. The first meeting I went to was really funny um, because I, I went in front of the league, uh, and I, I was in the executive committee or something, and and I, you know, they said, well, what are your, what's your vision? And I looked at them and I said, I don't, I don't have a vision. I'm not that smart. You guys tell me what we need to do to solve this problem. Who doesn't agree that we have a housing problem? No one raised their hand. We all agree we have a housing problem. Okay, so what do we do to solve it? And, and the league, the, the representatives from our municipalities were the ones that came up with these solutions. Said, what if we do this? What if we do this? What if we do this? And that led to great discussions with the development community. And I think we came out with some very, very uh, progressive ideas that aren't like Oregon, where you're just upzoning cities, or California, where you're upzoning an entire state, to the point where there was one community, I don't know if you guys heard about this in California, where they declared the entire city boundary, like inside the city, not outside inside the city a cougar sanctuary um, so that they wouldn't have to comply with the state's upzoning requirements. Um, you were going to move there. Christina's going to move there because it, it, Provo's next. Um, cougar sanctuary. That's terrible. Um, but there was a city. They tried to do that and of course the court struck it down because they said well inside the city boundary is probably not a good spot for cougars. Um, and, and I won't even get into the other jokes around cougars and sanctuaries, but um, we'll let that one go. Uh, but, but it's been a tremendously gratifying process. I'm not right, I, and, and you know, I can blame it on the uh, lingering effects of the anesthesia, in spite of what Mike says. Um, no, uh, can you, can you? In my, with my other hat on, and like the mayor, I like to wear different hats, um, about, Seven or eight years ago, uh, a couple partners and I started talking about what can we do to help people um, afford home ownership. And the more I've gotten into, into housing affordability discussions and looking at the future, think about, just with me here, 50 years in the future, 60 years in the future, your grandkids. They've never owned a home. They've rented their whole lives. Do they have savings from their 401k? Maybe. Does the company contribute a whole lot? Maybe. Are they able to survive financially long term after retirement on those savings? Probably not. Um, what does our state, what does our country look like then? We, we run the real risk of having a society where people are no longer anchored to their communities, where they're no longer they no longer have a stake in the system, right? As we've seen lately, the thing that makes a difference in our country is people who feel like, yeah, this is my country, this is my city, this is my state, I am a part of this. If we lose that, then what happens? And, and I'll give an example. Um, the, the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of people there that feel disenfranchised and not unrightfully so. Look at Venezuela. People feel disenfranchised. What do you do? You riot, because what do you got to lose? Um, you, you're not at risk for anything. When you own property, when you're a part of a community, when you're engaged in society, you have a stake in the ground there, and you're willing to defend it. Um, and that's one of the foundational principles of our country. If we lose that as a society, I'm glad we'll be dead. Um, because we've seen what happens in other societies where that is the case. Um, so home ownership to me is one of the most critical things we need to address over the next 15, 20, 30 years in our society. Because our, our financial model, and I don't know if we have any bankers in here, it's broken. When 75% of the people can't afford to get into ownership, we have a broken system. I was talking to somebody the other day, I said, well, you know, my barber, raised a family in a home he owned in Clearfield. How many barbers do you think can buy a home right now? I mean, maybe the person that does Christina's hair might be able to, because that's really expensive, you know, you gotta do all the, my wife gets her hair done, and I'm like, really, that's how much that costs? I get my hair cut, it's like $12, it looks like it. Um, we're, we're in a crisis of, of access. Um, and so one of the things that, that um, we tried to address is how do we pre provide additional access to home ownership? What's the, what's the barrier? What's the process? 
And so a couple of things we wanted to focus on. Number one, we wanted to be sustainable and, um, and, and um, perpetual. We didn't want to do something where you had to go out and raise a bunch of money, and then you spend the money, and then you got to go raise a bunch of money. I'm on the United Way board. That's painful. Um, you know, you're always out begging for money. We're begging for money from everybody. You know, hey, what can you do this year? Oh, gee, the funds dried up. We got to fire five people, or hey, we got three hundred thousand dollars to go hire three people for the next two years, and then we don't know what's going to happen to them. That's a crazy cycle. So we wanted to do something that was economically sustainable, and we wanted to do something that that was market reliant. We didn't want to manipulate markets. Um, for the same reason, we don't want to have to go out and, and try to get special privileges to drop prices here, drop prices there. There's a place for that, and, and we talked about that a little bit with our affordable housing. But in the broader market, that doesn't work because there's not enough government money in the world to solve housing affordability. I mean, we just don't. I mean, we printed how many trillions of dollars over the last few years? Not even close to solving any affordability problems, is there? We've, we've actually made it worse. We've created inflation and now we're, we're on the other side of it. So the government is not the solution to ownership and housing and affordability. Um, so we created a program where we, and I'll just try and describe it to you in the website, if you have your computer on, I won't feel bad if you Google this or look it up right now, rmhf.net, rockymountainhomesfund.net. And um, we completed a successful uh, $2 million uh, pilot program last year where we went to school teachers in the Weber School District and frontline healthcare workers in the Ogden area, and we offered them this opportunity and took in applications and, and we purchased houses for them and they uh, successfully got into their houses and it worked great. They're 100% payment compliant and so we said, okay, let's go to the next step. So we uh, did an $18 million round this year. Um, in March of this year, we launched it. And in March of this year, uh, we could find no houses. And so that was in this period where I was looking to run for re-election. I'm like, okay, no, I can't, I, I can't do this and that. We're going to have to build starter homes, as Mike said, because there aren't anybody building them. We didn't have anything under four hundred thousand dollars at the time, which is the market for teachers and firefighters and police officers and civil servants, and um, and, and we just didn't have it. Nurses and, and techs and those kind of people. So, oddly enough, now if we were here last year. These developers in the room would have been swinging from the chandeliers, singing Dire Straits song about money for nothing, and and uh, you know the realtors would have been just singing Happy Times. Everybody's making money. Everybody's slapping each other. And we're going to Cancun. We're going on cruises. This year, totally different story, right? The market turned. We have interest rate issues going on now. Prices have not come down to match our interest rates. Um, so now you have an even bigger gap between affordability and wages. And that gap has been growing over the years, right? If you go back 30 years, you know, the gap is this far. I have no use of my right arm, but it's now this far. Um, and for Mike's sake, if I drop my arm out of this sling. I got that. I got you. Um, see how long my arm is? Now, this arm is totally dead. The amount of momentum I could generate with this arm before it hit Mike's head would be fantastic. It would be like a club to his noggin. So he's got to be careful because this is a dead arm weapon right now. And I won't feel a thing. I'll, I'll bob and weave. I'll bob and weave. He's quick, though. And hey, Steve, we've got only a few minutes left. Okay. Can you explain how the I, I will, program yeah. trans transitions into ownership. Okay. So what we've done is we've created a split equity program. So a split equity financing program. So our investors are Intermountain Healthcare. Zions Bank, Cash Valley Bank, Bank of Utah, uh, American First Credit Union. Our investors put money into a, a profit-driven company, but it's a low-profit limited liability company, which means we can take into consideration things other than just driving profits. They own that fund. It's like a regular hedge fund. There's a PPM and everything. They invest money into that fund. We take that investment money and um, match it with money from a traditional lender. So American First Credit Union has been our initial lender on this. So they've given us traditional 30-year amortized financing. So we have two pots of money coming into this fund at the fund level. So the fund is securing the financing and the fund is securing the equity. So we're getting rates. Our last round of uh, money from American First was at 2.99%. That was last week. So yes, we're lucky. And, and they are very, they've been very, very good partners to understand the intent of this program and to contribute to it in that way. 
So we take this money, big pot, we go out and we solicit applicants. And we start out with teachers, and we start out with frontline healthcare workers in the Ogden area, we expand it to Logan. Uh, we're now in uh, Box Elder, Tooele, uh, Utah County, um, let's see, Cache County, Washington County, uh, we're launching in Miller County tomorrow. Um, I think that's, anyway, along, along, around the state. And we've opened it up to all public employees. So anybody that works for a public entity in the state of Utah is eligible. Um, and they simply go online to rmhf.net, they fill out an application. We take in the application, and we don't have the same restrictions on our applications that a bank does. We're getting our money from the banks, but it's at the fund level, so we can decide how we allocate it and appropriate it. And we're able to look, and we do three personal interviews with people, so we understand who's ready to sort of take this on and go from renting to ownership. They come in, and once we qualify them, we say, okay, you're able to afford this much of a payment. And based on this much of a payment, given our interest rate at you know three, and the 4% interest only payment, so we're, we're amortizing only half of the value of the home, and the other half is interest only, so that drops their payment another couple hundred dollars, they can go out and find the home that they want. They just go shop for their house, just like they would any other time. They come back to us, say, hey, we found a house, we do an inspection, and we have a cash close, so we're able to close very quickly, and, and uh, we don't have financing contingencies or anything goofy like that. So there, take for example now a $400,000 home, if you are to go, go get traditional financing, you'd be in the $2,500 a month range, we're at about seventeen dollars to $1,800 a month. So it's a huge advantage on a monthly payment. We also don't require a down payment. We require first and last month's rent as their down payment. We use that and we combine it with um, loan proceeds and we give them a six month custodial savings um, uh, account that we manage. But if they have a life event, they have a cushion to fall back on so they don't have to choose between rent, a car payment, buying food, buying medicine or anything else, we have this, this cushion for them that most of these people, again, have never had. Um, so all we're doing is we're just lowering the bottom rung of the ladder and in their contract, so they're signing a contract with the fund that owns the home. In that contract, from day one, every month when they make their payment, the principal reduction that they get from paying the loan goes to their account. They get half of the appreciation of the home on the other side. The investors get the other half, so that's the investor's upside, is they get a cash return and then they get half of the appreciation. But the family is also generating wealth from day one. And we wanted it to be like this so they would act like owners. We want them to be owners in the market. Um, and that's how they, they reacted. They said, this is my home. They're earning money for being in their home. They participate, they can finance us out, they can buy the home, they can sell the home. If they stayed and just did nothing, their payment the other part of this that's really critical is their payments aren't increasing over time. If anybody's paying rent, you know what rents have done in the last couple of years. Their payments are steady, so they can plan on the future. They have um, you know, a lot of additional capacity for their wage growth and all those things to feel like they're not just going to be continually paying that to rent. And they can exercise the option to purchase any time. They can is, they is have there a two-year two year debt period. Okay. So for the first two years, we just don't want people flipping and kind of abusing the program. So for the first two years, they can't exercise out unless they have an ex 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 exigent circumstance. Well, obviously, we'll let somebody go with you know, issues that they need to deal with. Um, but if they did nothing but stay in the home for the 10-year term of the contract and walked away at the end, they would, they would walk away, say goodbye to the home. We'd take the home. We'd still own it as a fund. And they would get a check for whatever their principal reduction is plus half of the value of appreciation over that 10 years. That's their worst case scenario. Um, so it's been tremendously fun. We've helped uh, a number of people so far. I think we're closing on our 20th home next week. We've deployed about uh, close to 10 million now, I think, of the, of the next fund. We've got lined up to be done and we'll launch um, Next round will be a $200 million fund about by the end of the year. We have about $100 million in commitments right now from, from great partners that want to do something. The other part for this group that I'll just touch on really quick before I whack Mike in the head with my dead arm um, is that we are working with a lot of municipalities, uh, counties, school districts, cities that have surplus property that they're trying to figure out how do we 
it's, people are done waiting for the crisis to be solved for them. The crisis is not going to be solved for them. They have needs, especially in rural Utah. So we have a nonprofit development entity that is working with those entities to try to create affordable starter housing where we would help them manage and create that and, and to whatever extent that the city or public entity subsidizes the land value to keep the cost down, lock that up for 99 years or into perpetuity so that you don't have a winner that you know gets the benefit after one round of that value, it stays locked up long term. So there's, there's a lot more to that. You've got the website, I'm available afterward to answer any questions. Thanks, Steve. And with that, we're going to wrap up because uh, we're out of time. I'll, I'll just end with this last thought. I, I wanted Steve to share that, and thanks to our other presenters, because I, I just I think as this crisis continues, we're going to all have to start thinking a little bit differently and coming up with creative solutions like that that don't necessarily look like what we're all used to. I think the private sector is pretty good about doing that, about figuring it out. My friend Scott Lawley with Destination Homes was like, we figured out, we're building, we can do 16 single family detached homes or slightly attached homes on an acre and they can be owner occupied. We're coming up with creative solutions. And I would just ask for our friends from cities or counties or wherever you're from, as those opportunities come in and they look different than what we're, than what we're used to because financing is different, money is different, Design is different, densities are different, all of those things are going to have to look different. Just be open to taking a look at that and saying, okay, let's figure out a way to try to make this work so that we can all do our part to, to alleviate or at least mitigate the, the crisis that is all of ours to share and to solve. So with that, thank you very much. And thanks to our panel members one more time.